in the dying days of Crockett promotions, which wrestler would have made the biggest impact? Minus the Hulkster, Randy Savage, Kurt Hennig, a young Bret Hart, Demolition. Pre- Hold on, this is well, wait, so- what? What now? <laughs> it, it, Besides it, everybody in the business, it, who would have made the most? What? It says minus the Hulkster, Randy Savage, Kurt Hennig, a young Bret Hart, Demolition, a brief stint with on with Andre, Roddy Piper, or Ted DiBiase. Okay, I I apologize, Jim. I maybe should have proofread this one a little bit more before I hit you with it, but. Which wrestler would have made the biggest impact on Crockett Promotions in 88? Is there anyone that would have made a big of impact to, to change things? Well, just, I couldn't even keep track of who we, we uh, uh, left out of that mix there. But who would have made a big impact in 88 in, uh, well, how about Bruiser Brody? That would have been interesting. Huh. Um. I mean, you know, it would have. It, I don't think anybody from the WWF in '88 would have, except maybe Hulk. Well, even then, Hulk Hogan, it would have been just such a cultured thing that I, the people in Greensboro would have booed him out of the fucking building. <clears throat> um, but most of the WWF guys wouldn't have made that big an impact because they were already on TV regularly and people were seeing them, and it, that. The war wasn't old enough yet that I think that people jumping sides – because think about it. Tully and Arn went to the WWF, and they got put with Heenan, and they they had the belts, and they had some good matches, but it wasn't like a game changer. Um, it, the, the WWF at that point had their audience, and the NWA had their audience. And, you know, great wrestlers can can do either. But I don't know that anybody from the WWF would have made a huge impact as much as somebody that – they either hadn't seen or hadn't seen in a long time or were just shocking for them to show up. Like Bruiser Brody shows up and says, I'm going to beat everybody's ass from Flair to Dusty to everybody. Or, you know, somebody of that nature that had been – was a top talent but had been out of the spotlight for a while would have probably been better uh, for for business. And there weren't that many of those then, to be honest. Think about it. Well, let me hit you with one name and ask you about a second one. What about Jake okay. Roberts, who wasn't listed here with the many, many names listed? And also – what were your thoughts always about the whole story? You know, it's kind of legendary about Wayne Ferris refusing to drop the Intercontinental title to Randy Savage. And the story was that he had talked to WCW about it going there when he was, or I shouldn't say WCW, Crockett Promotions, about going there, I guess, at the end of 87, early 88, with the Intercontinental title. What did you What did you heard about that at the time? I never heard anything about it at the time. <laughs> of course. <clears throat> I mean, they weren't running, uh, since I was just talent then, they weren't running... You know, their prospective talent acquisitions passed me for, hey, Cornette, you think we should do this? Um, e- boy, you know, I like Wayne, and I don't want him to get mad at me, but I don't – that would not have been a good thing probably because he, he the gimmick was perfect for the WWF in those days, and it wasn't serious enough for the NWA. And Wayne's style – which was don't take any more bumps than you have to, which is probably why he, he still walks around better than a lot of us um, would not have, would not have worked when he's in there with, as a heel. He, you know, he would have had to carry baby faces except for Barry Wyndham. He'd had to carry it Nikita in those days, or, you know, a lot of the top baby faces, the reason why they were so over is because the heels were the workhorses and, uh, and got them over. So, yeah, 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 I just, I can't see, I, I don't think that would have worked. What about Jake? Jake could do it, but once again, I don't know if, if they'd have made it serious, if they'd have made it serious, uh, you know, if he'd have just come in and started putting the snake on people, eh, but if, if he'd have fucking had the snake bite Barry Windham or Dusty Rhodes by the fucking jugular and a guy bladed his fucking neck, then we, yeah, because Jake could do the promos and he could still work in those days. What about Jim Duggan? You know, although the timeline doesn't exactly work, there was that period of time where he wasn't working for the WWF after they fired him for the Jersey Turnpike incident. Duggan, I think, would have been good. Duggan would have been good because he had worked Mid South and he knew what the fuck to do and he could talk and he was believable. So I think, uh, I think Duggan would have been good in hindsight for that, that point in time. And that was before he, you know, he caught WWF itis and, and, you know, he didn't need to work hard in those days in, in, in the WWF. It probably would have, you know, been detrimental because everybody else wouldn't have wanted to work with you. Cause they were all slacking off because, and think about the road schedule that they had, but it was, 
that was the thing in those days. The WWF, it was the gimmicks, it was the glitz, and it was uh, the matches were personal appearances and tights. And the NWA was the, the stuff that was supposed to make people believe these guys really hate each other and they're having a, a blood feud. How about Sergeant Slaughter? Oh, gosh, that's a good one. Slaughter was tremendously over for Crockett just in 80, what was it, 82, 83? 83, yeah. And just, you know, four or five years beforehand. So that would, and Sarge could talk and he could still work. So that would have been interesting. As a babyface or a heel. That's yeah, the other thing. It, it would have been hard for him to be a heel at that point because he had been such a huge baby face on television. Uh, but at the same time, that was his roots in Crockett was uh, was as a heel. So, but if he'd come in and uh, against the Russians, you know that then that would have been perfect. That would have been natural. They did, you know, in '85 after he left Vince, he did a couple shots in different places, and he never, other than Vern, he never worked for anyone past that, but. He did something in Mid South where they brought him into team with Terry Daniels, and then they did something with him in Mid Atlantic where after the Russians turned on, uh, I was about to say Don Kirshner. <laughs> That's not the right word. Yeah, Don, Don Kernodal. <laughs> they turned on Don, Don Kernodal. Kirshner Kernodal, the yeah. famed uh, host of uh, in Con- no Don Kirshner's rock concert. But Go after ahead. they turned on Kernodal, I believe Dusty for one time brought slaughter in the team of Kernodal against the Russians. And then it never happened again. But I feel like there's something that could have been done with slaughter, especially with the whole GI Joe tie in and his yeah. mid Atlantic connection, something I, I would almost think that if it was a booker other than dusty, maybe someone would have tried to do something. I don't, but I don't know what, what Sarge's uh, relationship was like with Crockett either. At that point, I know the reason why that Sarge left Vince was because he got the GI Joe thing and Vince wanted either a piece of it or didn't want him to do it at all. I can't remember. He didn't want him to but do it at all because it violated he didn't want the contract to, yeah. with LJN. That's right. That's right. And, you know, Sarge said, I'm going to be on GI Joe. Fuck you. But then the problem was by that point, there were very few promoters. He, that's when he went to work for Vern. He could have a lighter schedule and they were just ran bigger cities, but Vern's business was on the way downhill and there were very few other promoters that could afford him at that point. So, it just it didn't it ended up not working out for most people. 